Pastor Chuk Sogoye is the senior pastor of Resurrection Life Church Johannesburg. Pastor Chuk is a passionate teacher and preacher of the word of God. He has been blessed by God with the uncanny ability and gift to explain and unpack deep and complex spiritual truths in very easy to understand and apply formats. He is the host of the radio broadcast programs Living the Life and Amazing Power of Woman. Over the years, Pastor Chooks has been actively involved in marketplace ministries. He is an entrepreneur and business consultant with an avid passion for raising other entrepreneurs and business leaders. Here is Pastor Chooks Ogoye. Good evening. Welcome to another edition of our daily broadcast, our Bible study, Understanding the Goodness of God. Uh, we are on episode 112. Hallelujah. 112. Uh, my name is Chuck Sugoye, and I will be sharing, um, uh, continuing the, the contemplation we started a few episodes ago. God is too good to kill. God is too good to kill. So today is part eight. Um, if you haven't been part of the series or you've not watched uh, some of them, I want to encourage you to go to our YouTube channel. The details are on the screen. And, and just go, you know, um, listen and watch. Especially what I have been saying from part one of this series, God is too good to kill. And I'm taking my time to walk you through scriptures and show you the, the true character of the God we serve. Our God does not kill. <laughs> he has not killed anybody. Jesus did not kill anybody. Instead, he came to give life and to give it to us more abundantly. That's what he came to do. He came that we may have life and we may have it more abundantly. He taught us to pray for our enemies. To taught, he taught us to, to pray for those who oppose us, not to kill them. So tonight um, is episode number eight. Oh, sorry, part number eight on that series, God is Too Good to Kill. All right. I, 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 yesterday, I... I, I did an expose on Acts uh, chapter 12 um, at verse 20, thereabout, 20, 20 to 23, on the death of Herod the king. I know because people always cite that story and say the angel slapped him and he died. Well, <laughs> I, I showed you yesterday in episode, episode 111, uh, the angel did not slap him to kill him. <laughs> He, 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 he died of, of some disease. And I want to show you something tonight. Uh, I just want to complete that thought from yesterday. And I will, you know, dovetail into something else for tonight. So go with me to First Peter chapter 5. I want to explain something to you about the devil. First Peter chapter 5. Oh, we read at verse 8 and 9. He said, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, your enemy, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. There's only one devourer and his name is Satan. He is the devil. He's the one that devours. God does not devour people. Satan is the one that devours people. And the word devour there is the word swallow. Is to munch and swallow. Okay. So, so what happened to Herod was that he was devoured. The enemy devoured him. God does not devour. The enemy devours. He says, seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9, resist him. So, he can be stopped. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Resist him. So, the fact that the enemy is roaming around, Seeking whom he may devour means that he cannot devour everybody. So, so there, in, there must be some criteria that he's using to select his victim. Who can the enemy devour? So, so what happened to Herod? When the, when the angels smote him, which we saw from scriptures was to tap him to get his attention. He was, he was carried away by the psychophancy of his subjects. And they were praising him because they wanted favor. They wanted food from him. And they were praising him and they began to be overt. And began to say, he, this is the voice of a God, not a man. 
and he began to savour that that psychophancy and began to accept it. And the angel, you know, s struck him to to bring him back to his senses, as it were, to get his attention. To get his attention. Why was the angel trying to get his attention? Let me let me tell you what I I think about it. Why was the angel trying to get his attention? He was entering into dangerous territory. See, trying to take the glory of God is a sin. Okay? And God does not kill people because of sin. However, I say it often, God does not punish us for our sin. But our sin punishes us. Sin has consequences. That's the truth. Sin does have consequences. Sin has consequences. And it's not God that, that, that inflicts the, the, the pain because sin in itself has consequences. So, so your sin uh, will, will throw things at you. There are consequences to sin. So this man was drifting into sin. He was drifting into sin taking up the glory that belongs to God, accepting that he is now God, not a man. And he was drifting into sin. And an angel came and, you know, tapped him to, 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 to bring his attention. You are drifting. What, one of the things that happens when we drift into sin is that we move away from the protection of God. We move away from the, from the covering of God. And we enter into a territory where the enemy can smack us. Where the enemy can devour. The Bible says in this text that I read that he is roaming about seeking who he will devour. He was roaming around looking for who he's going to chow. Who are the people that he can chow? The people that don't have, that don't have protection. The people that don't have anybody to defend them. The people that don't have boundaries to cover them. And that's what sin does. Sin pulls you away from the covering of God. This is the reason why God says don't sin. Don't do it. Because when you do it, you are pulled away and you come into territory that makes you vulnerable. I often tell the story of my dog that, you know, I, 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 we got a puppy. And I was, you know, teaching this puppy... Uh, to abide with the rules of the house and one of the rules of the house is that dogs don't run out of the gate when the gate opens so we had an older dog that knows the rules so he never tries to run out so if you open the gate it doesn't matter how long the gate is open he doesn't try to run out of the gate but this puppy is you know still trying to learn the the rules of the house and the puppy will you know try to run out of the gate and will caution the puppy will try to run out of the gate will caution the puppy so one particular day, I drove out from the gate, and I didn't know when the puppy ran out. And the puppy jutted out, and I didn't know. So I drove out, and the gate closed. So by the time the puppy came back to the gate, the gate was already closed. And he could not, she could not get back inside. And that was traumatic for her. So she, start, she stood by the closed gate, whimpering. And crying. Obviously, my family inside the house, inside the compound, did not hear her whimpering. And she was there whimpering for some time. I don't know how long. A neighbor who lived across the road heard her whimpering. And this neighbor is a dog lover. He has dogs and loves dogs. And realized, okay, this dog is traumatized and is whimpering here. And he's a puppy. So he came and rescued my puppy and took my puppy to his house. So later in the evening, when it was feeding time, my, my, my wife and son were trying to find the puppy, look for the puppy for food, and they couldn't find the puppy. So they phoned me, we cannot find Joe in the house. I'm like, wow, what are we going to do? I said, you know, where I am now, I'm not going to be able to come back immediately. I'm going to come back later. So when I come back, I deal with it. So when I got back later in the evening, as I drove to, into my compound, I saw a notice, a note on my gate. And there was a phone number there, and, and the note says, your puppy is in my house. Something like that. And then they put their number. 
So because it was late, I decided not to call the person. And also, I mean, I had, you know, uh, um, some kind of comfort that the puppy was safe because somebody had the puppy in their house. So I went to sleep. The next morning, which was a Saturday, I called the number and the man, you know, picked up and said, I am your neighbor at so, 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 and so number. Please come get your puppy. So I went there. When I got there, I found my puppy traumatized. He was in the midst of six other dogs or so, or five or six other dogs, and he was shivering. When, I, you know, when she saw me, she was happy. I picked up the puppy, thanked my neighbor, and brought the puppy back home. And you know, the moment I brought the puppy home, she got it. This is the reason they don't want me to run out of the gate. You know, from that day, it's been many years now, maybe seven years or so, she has never run out of the gate again. You know, she, from that day, she has, she learned the lesson. Now, this is the point of the story. If, when she ran out of the gate and a car ran over her, God forbid, will it be anybody's fault? It will be her fault because she left the confines of the compound where there's safety and ran out of the gate. And that's what sin does. Sin gives you outside of the gate where the enemy can hit you. Thank God that our neighbor who, who rescued her is not an enemy. But an enemy could have picked her up and stolen her. You know, someone could have picked her up and stolen her. And it would not be us that, you know, subjected her to be stolen by a stranger. It would be her fault because she left the gate. That's what happens when you sin. You move away from the boundaries of safety, the boundaries of divine protection, and you make yourself vulnerable. Now, that doesn't mean that the enemy must hit you, but it makes you susceptible to the attack of the enemy. Yeah, it makes you susceptible to the attack of the enemy. Now, if you know your rights in Christ, you can still resist the enemy. You can still resist him. But, you know, if you don't know who you are, the enemy can mess you up. That's why there are boundaries. That's why God has given us boundaries. So when we stay in the boundaries, we are safe. There are boundaries around our health. There are boundaries around our marriages. There are boundaries around our life as Christians. Stay in the boundaries. Don't, don't veer off. And, and, and open yourself up where you are tempted or pushed into sin or pushed into to do things. You, you should know where you are weak and stay far away from the boundary. Don't test your, 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 your capacity. No, don't push yourself to the extreme where you now, you know, cave in and the pressure is too much. All right. So I believe that the angel tried to bring this man to some, you know, attention so that, you know, you are drifting, you are going into territory that you are not protected but obviously maybe he didn't but the bible doesn't tell us he didn't heed and he got struck by the enemy and he got sick and you know history has it that he died uh, some days later or maybe a week or two i don't know but not immediately but he got sick because he had drifted into a territory so it seems to me it's a conjecture, but it seems to me that the angel observed that the enemy who is walking around like a roaring lion was around the corner, seeking whom. So, so it, it, it looks like the angel saw the mouth of the enemy opened up to swallow the herod, and he tried to get this guy to his senses. Hey, pay attention! You are you are drifting. You are drifting into. A territory you are going outside of the gate you are going to be child you are going to be child hey 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 but obviously herod did not get it but what i'm saying is conjecture uh, but, but i mean there's reason for me to make that conjecture because he was struck with sickness which he never recovered from and that sickness came from the enemy he's the one who 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 gives sickness god does not give sickness the enemy gives sickness the spirit of affliction comes from the devil. So he's the one who gives sickness. So, so we, 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 we see the effect. He got the sickness and then he, you know, it degenerated to the point where worms were eating up his body and then he died. So I have proven it to you. The, God did not kill that guy. 
the angel was actually trying to protect him. <laughs> was trying to bring his attention. You are drifting. You are, you are moving into dangerous area where you are going to be child. Pay attention. And he didn't pay attention. And, and, and I don't know who you are. Many times the Lord will, you know, blow that alarm for you and, and say, pay attention. You are drifting. C can I tell you something? Every child of God that's listening, please hear what I'm saying. God will, you know, warn you and the Holy Spirit and angels will try to keep you. But many times we are stubborn and we drift ourselves into problems. We drift ourselves into unnecessary stress because we didn't hear the reprimand of the Holy Spirit. We didn't hear the, 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 the restraint of the Holy Spirit. There are some places you are going. The Spirit says, don't go there. There are some times you want to make a call to a certain person. He said, don't make that call. Don't make that call. But you refuse to listen and you make that call and you get yourself into trouble. You get yourself into trouble. And sometimes the trouble brings unnecessary stress. You know, and, and God forbid, the trouble can actually be fatal. If you don't know your rights, to be able to fight your way back and resist the devil. The Bible tells us that you can resist the devil. Even though you have, been, you have strayed into his territory, you can resist him and God will come to your rescue in his territory and pull you out. But that's dependent on whether you know your right as a believer. All right. So, that leads me to another story. Go with me to the book of Acts chapter 13. Book of Acts chapter 13, verse 6 to 11. There's another story here. Let me, let's go. Let's read. Verse 6. Chapter 13 of Acts, verse 6. Now when they had come, gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimas the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all, of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now, this is one of those examples that people quote and say, see, God, God kills people. God can strike people with blindness. God but can we analyze this story? So, there is this ruler. He's a proconsul. His name is Sergius Paulus. He, he, he is a high-ranking politician and administrator for the Roman Empire. In those days, these guys will have some prophet around them to advise them and to help them with spiritual counseling and guidance and so on. But this particular guy that he got, Elimas, was a false prophet. He's a Jew, but a false prophet. So he wasn't, wasn't real. And, and it seemed to me to be a man who was um, a practicer of the occult arts. So he was an occult, occultist, a magician, a sorcerer. The Bible says he was a sorcerer. So he was a man who used diabolical powers. So... Obviously, his, his diabolic ministry to Sergius Paulus was no longer satisfying to Sergius Paulus. So, Sergius Paulus' Bible says, he heard about Barnabas and, and Apostle Paul and sent for them that they can come and preach the word of God to him. So, Sergius Paulus sent for the apostles, Paul and Barnabas, to come and minister to him. And they, they came to preach the word to him. Now, the Elimas the sorcerer, by Jesus, as they often call him, was not comfortable with uh, uh, the thought of Sergius Paulus getting born again. Uh, because, obviously, if Sergius Paulus gets born again, 
he will no longer subscribe to his services. <laughs> so he will be redundant. Maybe whatever money he was getting from, from you know, uh, uh, spiritually misleading <laughs> the, the proconsul, that money will be gone. Number two, I believe that the demonic uh, uh, agenda of the kingdom of darkness was being filtered through this magician, this sorcerer, Elimas, and influencing Sergius Paulus, who was a leader. That way, this kingdom of darkness had an influence over that region and over that territory, which is what normally happens. Because when you get the heart of the leader, the, 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 the agenda of, of whosoever that has the heart of the leader is filtered through, and the region comes under demonic influence. That's what happens with all the different demonic and diabolic agendas Satan pushes. He uses the people who are close to leaders to push those agenda. Agendas that are anti the gospel, anti, you know, the kingdom of God. So, I believe the hell wanted Sergius Paulus under their grip so that they can continue to influence the territory that Sergius Paulus was ruling. So, 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 uh, the, the idea that Sergius Paulus could get born again was very, very offensive to hell. So hell empowered this, this magician, this sorcerer, to pervert the, 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 the ministration of the word from um, Apostle Paul and, and his companion uh, Barnabas. So, and it seemed to me like whatever Sergius Paulus, uh, whatever Elimas was doing, he was doing it through his eyes. It seemed to me that he was a diabolic, uh, occultic manipulation of the mind of, of Sergius Paulus so that he would not receive the word. He would not understand the word. So the Bible said that he opposed the apostles while they were preaching. So what did Paul do? The Bible says Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. Because Paul on, on saw that there's something diabolic happening here. What I'm preaching, and, and, and as a preacher, I've encountered that a few times. When you're trying to preach, and somebody is in the audience trying to cast a spell upon the people so that the people are not hearing the word. Or sometimes they're trying to cast a spell at you to confuse you so that your thoughts are, are confused so that you don't hear. I, I, I have been in those you know, instances a few times when I'm preaching the gospel and have to take authority over the foul spirit and cast down that foul spirit. And, 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 and break up the atmosphere so that the word of God can go through. So, this was what was happening. And um, so, Bible says, Apostle Paul looked intently at this magician, this sorcerer, and addressed him. He says, verse 10, Oh, you all full of all deceit and all fraud, deception and fraud, was what was emanating from the heart of this guy. Son of the devil. Enemy of all righteousness. Will you not see he's perverting the straight ways of the Lord? So he was perverting what the Lord was trying to do. He was trying to pervert it. He was trying to pervert it. And I believe by occultic means, he was trying to pervert it. God was trying to reach Sergius Paulus and by extension to reach the whole region so that the people because if their leader is saved it's easier for the gospel to go in it's easier for th th things to be done in the region so he was perverting this and paul will not have that now paul being filled with the holy spirit released the power of god and declared him blind for a season for a season so it was temporary blindness to stop him from perverting the ways of the Lord. So he made him blind for a season. And the Bible says mist filled his eyes. So the demonic and occultic witchcraft that he was practicing ceased. Because it seemed like it was coming from his eyes. It ceased. And then the word of God was able to go through. Bible says in verse 12. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done being astonished at the teaching of the word. So the word was able to penetrate. And he was as astonished at the teaching of the word. So, so he understood the thing that, they were being, that, that was being taught to him by the apostles, P Paul and Barnabas. 
and, 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 and he believed. And Bible said when he saw what had ha happened. So, this is what I believed happened there. Remember how Apostle Paul got born again? It was a similar process. He got blind for a season. And he had time to process the word. And process what had been spoken to him. And then he gave his life to Christ. And Apostle Paul saw this guy and realized this guy needs help. This guy needs to be born again. So, and he thinks he has power. So what he did was to limit his interference with the preaching of the gospel. And the only way to do it was to stop the channel through which the, this magical acts and witchcraft was, which was proceeding from, which was his eyes. This is my conjecture. And he, you know, he made him temporarily blind. We don't know how long he was blind, but Bible says it was for a season. What it was was so that he could think about the things that Paul had just said. Because Paul said, will you not cease? Meaning, I'm giving you an opportunity to cease perverting the ways of the Lord and get born again. So, so and the Bible said he was led by hand. Which was also what happened to Paul. The day he got converted or the day he got struck by lightning, he was led by hand. And then Ananias came and preached to him and explained to him and then restored his sight and he got born again. So I believe Paul saw this guy because exactly what Sergius, uh, 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 Elimas the sorcerer was doing, opposing the gospel, was what Paul was doing. Paul opposed the gospel. Paul opposed the gospel. In fact, he was knocked down from his horse on his mission to go and persecute Christians in Damascus. And, and he was brought to a place of humility. So, so Paul understood what, where this guy is. You're opposing the gospel. I used to do that. And the only way that I got saved was when I became temporarily blind. And in those three days that I was blind, I was able to process the word and allow the Spirit of God minister to me, and I got saved. May the same thing happen to you. So Paul extended almost like his testimony to this guy to give him an opportunity. So can you see that what Paul did was actually a good thing because he used that blindness to restrain this guy and bring him to a place where he could hear the word, where he could receive the word, where he could get born again. There are many people that God will want to save. And, and they need to go through a process like this for, a, for a, you know, being incapacitated for a season so that they can consider you know, the, 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 the message of the gospel and be saved. See, God does not want us to kill people. So what Paul did here was so much in line with the teachings of Jesus. He says, do good to them that hate you. Do good to them that hate you. Luke chapter 6 verse 27. Love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. So what Paul did was to do good to this guy by causing that, that witchcraft power that was emanating from his eyes to be halted for a season so that he could see that, number one, I don't have any power. These magical powers are is a fraud. These things are not true. It's a fraud. Number two, God loves me. And God wants me to stop perverting his ways. I can come into the kingdom. So, so what Paul did was an act of good. By restraining the, the occultic powers that this guy was working with. So this guy realized these things actually are, are, are deceptive. These things don't have... They are not real. They are not <laughs> real. It's like the magicians of Pharaoh. Who, who when Moses threw his rod and he became a snake. They also threw their rod and he became snakes. But to show you that he was not real. Moses' rod, Moses' snake, swallowed up the, the snakes of the, 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 the magicians in, Acts, in, in Exodus chapter 7. Swallowed up the, 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 those snakes. And they didn't become fatter. In fact, after they were swallowed up, Moses you know, pulled the rod, the snake, from the tail and it became a rod again. So where were those snakes? They were not real. So that's what Paul was addressing the guy. This thing is, you are full of fraud. This thing is a fraud. You think you have power, but it's fraudulent. It's not real power. So he was given this guy an opportunity to get saved. And he showed him mercy. 
It's not like he made him blind forever. No, he just temporarily blind to restrain him so that he can rethink his life. So, so he showed he extended mercy to him. <laughs> the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 that God is rich in mercy. He showed him his mercy. The Bible says in, in Psalm 37 verse 26 that God is ever merciful. So what this guy experienced was the mercy of God. It was the mercy of God that he will not perish and go to hell. But that he will, he will you know, have an opportunity to receive the gospel and be born again. I want to say this. Please. God is on trial. God is on trial all the time. In fact, let me show you from scriptures. Romans chapter 3 verse 4. God is on trial. And, and, and when God is on trial, can you try and be on, on the side of God and be a witness for him? This is what we are called to do, to be a witness for God, to testify of his character, not to be against him, not to, not to display the character of the devil, but to display the character of God. See, Romans chapter 3, verse 4. Look at this. He says, certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may, be, and may overcome when you are judged. And may overcome when you are judged. God is constantly being judged. And when people start judging God and saying God is not good, God is wicked, God kills people, Please, can the church of Jesus Christ, can God's people stand on God, with God on the same side to defend his character, to be a witness of the goodness of God's character, of the merciful heart of God, and, and, and not go on the opposite side and begin to portray God as a wicked God, as a God that kills, as a God that is harsh, as a God that is mean. When we do that, we are not bearing real witness for him. We are bearing witness against him. We are bearing witness against him. God wants us to be on his side. Be on the side of God. So when you encounter these passages in scriptures that tend to suggest that God is not good or God is mean or God kills people. No, 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 no. Be on the side of God. See, Jesus never killed anybody. Jesus never supported people who wanted to kill. Instead, Jesus stopped them from killing people. So, so, what I'm saying to you tonight is, any time that God is being put on trial to say that he's not good, and people are trying to marshal evidence to show that God is mean or wicked, be on the witness side. Be on God's side to be a witness for him. This is why you need to know your Bible and, and, and agree with the spirit of Christ that he came to save lives, not to destroy them. He came to save lives. Not to destroy them. That's the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit came to save lives and not to destroy. And may we stand together with the spirit of God and be a witness of the gospel. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, one more story knocked on the head. God did not, God is not a killer. And God did not kill uh, uh, Elimas. Instead, it was a demonstration of love to restrain him from practicing magical acts and perverting the, the, the process. And guess what? The Bible says, when Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man, when he saw what was done, he believed the teaching. He believed the teaching. When he saw what was done, he believed the teaching and he got born again. And, and, and God was glorified. And the region had, a, you know, a, 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 their leader open up for the gospel. Hallelujah. I pray today that our leaders will have an encounter with the word. Our leaders from the president all the way, everybody, that they will submit to the word of God. And, and, and the spirit of God can work in their hearts so that our nation, the nation of South Africa and the nations of the world can come under the influence of the gospel. Because when a nation is and its leaders are open to the gospel, then we can penetrate with the works of Jesus. We can penetrate with the message of the kingdom. And we can do the works of God and, and get people saved in large numbers. I pray that what we have here that happened in the story we read in, 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 in Acts chapter 13, verse 6 to 11, will happen in our time. And, and happen to our leaders that they can have an opportunity to get born again. So we pray today 
for every leader, every person in authority who has been under a spell of a magician, of a sorcerer, that that spell be broken in the name of Jesus. That, that the spell cast over the region be broken in the name of Jesus. That our leaders will come to the knowledge of Christ, to the knowledge they will hear the word and they will respond to the teaching of the word. As Sergius Paulus responded to the teaching of the word, they will respond to the teaching of the word and their heart will be, will be saved and their souls will be saved. And every magician, every false prophet out there, we put a restraining order upon your craft in the name of Jesus. We put a restraining order upon your magical acts and we set the region that you have, you have put under a spell we set the region free in the name of Jesus. And I speak right now that the gospel will penetrate every, every province, every nation, every place where this message is being heard today. That the gospel will penetrate with power and souls will be saved in millions. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, thank you so much. Tomorrow, we continue our daily broadcast. Uh, and tomorrow is the amazing power of woman broadcast and we have something very special tomorrow very 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 special uh, you don't want to miss it 7 p.m south african time um and we'll be happy to to uh minister to you if you do have any questions if you need prayer that number on the screen plus two seven eight one four two one zero eight three five uh please contact us on that number we'll be happy to reach out to you and minister to you according to the grace that god has given to us god bless you good night i'll see you tomorrow 7 p.m south african time there comes a time in your life when you need a change, an upgrade. You need upliftment. You need lasting results. You just want your life to be real. You need your life to be meaningful, deep, full, purposeful and easy. You're looking for enlargement, amplification, increase, strengthening. You're looking for growth in your life. You want leverage, strategic advantage, gain and favor, ability to influence clout and strength join us at resurrection life church every sunday visit our website dot reslife.org.za for more information make this year your year of being real embrace rapid enlargement and leverage it is your time